Good afternoon and welcome to the fourth in our series of COVID-19 presentations. My name is Mike Charles and today uh, the panel will be discussing the relaxation of the social care <coughs> responsibilities and also the recent announcement by the Education Secretary in England. Sadly, I cannot be with you this afternoon for the whole duration, but I will be passing the host duties over to my very delightful colleague and dear friend, uh, Mr. John Ford, uh, the Sinclair's Law Managing Director, a solicitor with years and years of experience. And um, John, over to you. Good afternoon and over to you. And uh, uh, thank you all so very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Well, this is the first time I've hosted one of these and um, the previous ones I've seen have been so impressive, I can't possibly match that. But I will just say a little bit about the other people who um, are on the panel this afternoon. Um, there's Helen Gill, who's been a colleague of mine for more than 10 years, who was very experienced at doing education and community care cases. And we, we both work in the London office of Sinclair's. Charlotte Hadfield is a barrister of much experience in doing education and related work and, um, and um, she practices in London but I think all over the place as well. Um, and then there's Chris Barnett. I'm, I'm assuming you can see all the names. I, I can see all six of us or five of us here. Uh, Chris Barnett um, is another very experienced education solicitor who um, has been working in this field for at least 15, 20 years or more now. Uh, and um, he's based in the office in Twickenham. Um, we've, uh, we may have got a couple of questions that I can uh, kick off by di discussing, but I expect there'll be others that come in during this session. Um, we're going to try and deal with um, predicting or uh, advising on what the very uncertain situation is going to be when, when um, this new guidance um, is implemented. Um, it, only, it was only issued yesterday. I, I haven't digested it properly. I'm, I'm sure my colleagues have seen uh, some of it as well. Um, the, uh, I think that the picture I have is that actually no one really knows what's going to happen. I don't think the, the government know, the schools don't really know. It's the same as all the other aspects that have been affected by the, by the, um, the crisis. Uh, so it's quite hard to give uh, any firm legal in opinion about what uh, what people should do um, but there are some general pointers um, I mean for example at, at the moment at the time when this this crisis hit us we've got um, uh, various processes going on including the EHC plans being um, rewritten and um, the, uh, the, the question is being asked, what's, what's going to happen? Uh, um, there are timescales which, which were supposed to be, which were being followed in the, um, in the Children and Families Act. Um, and the question is being asked, what, what happens if, um, those strict time limits may not apply. Um, there was a question about this um, from Tony Kenyon. I don't want to find the question. Um, and I think that this kind of inconsistency will appear everywhere that um, the, the time scale of six weeks limit to get advice from um, uh, in order to, to to draft a plan that was provided by the 2014 regulations, the the, the um, guidance now says that the local authority have to respond in a timely manner 
in accordance with general public law principles. Well, we're all public lawyers as well as being education experts. And I think we, we would say that gives a great deal of um, leeway for the authority because it all comes down to what is, is reasonable and reasonably practicable. My, my own opinion is that although this does produce um, a, a margin of uh, discretion for the authority, they can't just say we, we don't have to do it because this guidance allows us to um, take our time. They have to show in every case what they've actually been doing to, um, to, to do it as soon as possible. So they have to show the steps that they've taken. Um, I don't know what my, the others, uh, what my colleagues think about this sort of question. Uh, let's see what anyone else has got to say about it. Sure, well, I think I can address some of that, John. In terms of the, the specific question that that was asked, which I think relates to the, the way that the new regulations have been set out and the different or slightly different approach that it's taken with different timelines. Um, uh, the, the, the final position, I think, is going to be that the, the test that would be applied if, if one's looking at court proceedings or considering whether or not the local authority has complied with a reasonable practicability test or a public law reasonableness test will come down to the same, the same thing. And, uh, the, the government certainly has taken a slightly different approach with some of the, the regulations than, than with others as to how they are reducing the, the requirements or giving local authorities the opportunity to, uh, to say that in certain circumstances anyway it's not been practicable for reasons arising from the COVID-19 situation to, uh, to comply with a deadline. But I certainly agree as well that it's not uh, it's not carte blanche for local authorities in every case just to say we're not able to uh, to do this because of COVID-19. There does need to be some evidence that they have made reasonable attempts to do it and they've, um, it's not been reasonably practicable and why that's the case. And uh, it also isn't, I think, um, something that's going to, to mean that they have an indefinite amount of time. To, uh, to undertake assessments or to comply with, with deadlines where they're capable of doing so, they, they should still be doing that. Um, but certainly in terms of the, the way the regulations are now set out, there is going to be more leeway for local authorities and they're, they're going to undoubtedly be cases where local authorities rely on that kind of exception to, uh, to take longer. I think we've seen you know, that's been happening in any event, uh, even prior to the uh, regulations formally coming into effect from today. But uh, now it is the formal legal position. It's uh, it's going to be more difficult in a lot of situations to uh, to challenge timings, at least, um, until there there really reaches a stage when local authorities either haven't been doing anything or have uh, have not taken obvious and practical steps to uh, to sort things out. Thanks very much, Chris. Yeah, I think that's right, isn't it? I mean, the problem is that prior to the change in the regulations, um, if you, you would wait your, your six weeks or your five weeks or whatever the relevant deadline is, depending on what you're waiting for. And if the local authority hadn't issued an EHC plan or concluded its EHC needs assessment or whatever the uh, thing you were waiting for was, you could generally send them a letter under the Judicial Review Pre-Action Protocol saying you had this much time under the statute to get this done, you haven't done it, we now require you to do it or we're going to issue a claim. And I think um, that Chris is right that this doesn't mean an open-ended deadline for local authorities, but it does mean that instead of a situation where the local authority will then have to issue the plan effectively, there can be a certain amount of, that there may be a certain amount of tussling or resistance on the basis of it's not it's not reasonably practical for us to do it right now. And so we, we as practitioners, I think, don't really know what that's going to look like or exactly how the court is going to receive those arguments until, I suppose, until people start testing it um, by, by, by pressing the local authority to act within uh, the previous deadline. It makes, things, it makes things fuzzier, doesn't it? It makes it a bit harder to know definitively when you're in the right position to issue a claim. 
That's absolutely sure. That's I completely agree. Yes, it's um I think it won't we won't really know how the courts will interpret it until the case is actually issued. And I suppose that it will be in some respects, even though it's a judicial review, a factual exercise in working out exactly um whether it was in fact that reasonably practical and the local authority just the best of its duty, but it does make it an awful lot harder. Um, whilst this is enforced, of course, I mean, this is a temporary position problem if you just don't know how long it will last for, because whilst there is a set time limit for this, um, it can be extended if necessary. I've got a question's come in in the last minute or so, I've just seen. Um, I'm not sure who it's from, but I'll just read it out. Um, I don't know the answer, actually. Um, the council have today put forward their position statement for an EO test. That's uh, education otherwise than at school, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. Question for, oh, it is from Angela. Thank you, Angela. No notice has been made of consultation or risk assessments on the effects of on those who it affects. Reference uh, section 42 of the yeah. Children and Families Act, reduced to a reasonable endeavours duty. Why has the Secretary of State done this? And will this be legally challenge, challenged? Um, I think it was probably for me as well to start off with, John. Um, yes, uh, I saw, well, I, I saw there was another question as well, um, which I think raised the same point or asked the question about Section 42, which is the, the duty on local authorities to secure the education, uh, the provision that's set out in the Education, Health and Care Plan, Section F. Um, and that has also been brought in from today, um, the, the modifications that were allowed under the Coronavirus Act to reduce the local authority's duty from the absolute obligation to secure that provision to, uh, to now only a reasonable endeavours duty, um, effectively giving them again the same sort of uh, leeway to rely on issues arising from coronavirus and COVID-19 restrictions to, uh, to say that they have done all they can to, uh, to deliver and secure the provision that's set out. Um, in relation to, the, to challenging the, the notice um, and the decision to make the notice, obviously it did, the power was created under the Coronavirus Act specifically for the Secretary of State to give the notice. So any challenge to the notice in terms of its uh, legal status or the legality of, of making a notice at all would only po be possibly brought I think on the public law ground of irrationality or perversity um, in terms of the reasons and things and there, there were no consultation requirements for example put in the coronavirus act so I think it would be very difficult most of the time to argue that there was a, a duty to consult or, uh, or to give any, any other notice uh, prior to actually putting this in place as it was fully authorised by the by the Coronavirus Act, so uh, it, there there may still be. Obviously, it's it's come out yesterday, so uh, putting it on well, nobody has yet, I think, um, reached a final view on whether it's capable of being challenged. Um, there there are some reasons, uh, and some of the guidance certainly may be more questionable in terms of the way it actually describes the uh, the effect of the the changes, um, and it certainly. Uh, may lead to the challenges being brought, but uh, it may be very difficult, I think, to challenge the, the principle of making the, the notice in the first place, where uh, notwithstanding that some of the reasoning that it gives, I think, is certainly based on uh, some assertions and, and some very generalised comments about the impact on local authorities of the, the restrictions and the coronavirus situation. Um, it may be very difficult, I think, to, to persuade a court that local authorities have not been affected uh, in any way so that it wouldn't be reasonable or at least rational for the Secretary of State to conclude that giving the notice was uh, a, a possible course to, to take. Yeah, turning to the, um, I think that's, I think that must be right, mustn't it? I mean, turning to the um, question of reasonable um, the, the reasonable endeavours duty and what it means. I suppose we've gone from a an absolute statutory duty in section 42, which is if it's in the EHC plan, it's got to be done, no ifs, no buts, to a situation where the local authority has to use its reasonable endeavours to secure the provision in the plan, um, but if it takes more time than usual to do that, 
or if it is unable for some reason to do that. I mean, I suppose an immediate, uh, an immediate example might be in a given area, there might not be enough teaching assistance for all children to have the one-to-one -one provision that would normally be in the plan, something along those lines, something directly connected to the coronavirus um, situation, perhaps lots of people shielding were unavailable. Um, and in those circumstances, the local authority you can you can still challenge the local authority's refusal to make that provision um and then but then instead of a cut and dried um you haven't done this you had to do it therefore you're in breach there is more likely to be an argument around whether the local authority has used reasonable endeavors in order to get that provision or not i mean obviously there is a big difference between reasonable endeavors that don't succeed in getting the provision or getting it immediately and reason and no endeavors or not enough endeavors so those are the kind of arguments that I think we're going to be having over the next few months. Um, I mean, I think probably the, the guidance doesn't really help us with what the test is going to be for reasonable endeavours, but it's a public law question. And so I would expect that it will be something like what would a reasonable local authority with the information and um, resources of the local authority making the decision do in those circumstances. So it's going to be something, something like that. Um, but as I say, there's a really, there's a very big difference between reasonable endeavours and no endeavours or not enough. And it's, I suppose it is possible, I, certainly we've heard reports, I think even before the, the Secretary of State gave the notice, um, we, we were hearing reports, I think, of some uh, parents being told we're not making this provision now because of the coronavirus situation, which would not be the right way to approach the question of reasonable endeavours. No, absolutely. And it's interesting the use of the term reasonable endeavours, um, which is a very much a sort of uh, term used in, in a lot of contracts, actually. Um, uh, sometimes you will have a, a phrase best endeavours, which is much, much stronger. And yet, Secretary of State's obviously used the, the phrase reasonable endeavours, and it is quite vague. I imagine that when the courts are interpreting it, they may be looking at um, sort of guidance from private law, I suppose, um, because of the, of the way that term is, is, is used. It is interesting, um, but it's, it's, it's going to be very much depending on a particular case. I think if anyone has a, a concern that the provision is not being met, and for example, could you have speech and language therapy, which is in section F of the EHC plan, is it possible to have that um, done remotely? via Zoom, for example, or, or, or something else, um, or Teams, and um, if that is possible, but local authorities won't fund that, I suppose that will be a challenge because it is reasonably practicable for that to happen, um, and that, that's not an excuse. So I think if there's a concern, I think you have to just ask advice and then and then see if there's a particular case arising from it. It's frozen for the moment, I think. Helen's frozen. So I'm um, occasionally I might stop. Um, my my Wi-Fi is a little bit unstable, so occasionally I might fr I may freeze. <laughs> so apologies <laughs> for that. Um, I know they've been talking about education aspects. Um, uh, and uh, the, our subjects was going to include uh, wider social care questions. There's, there's, there's an, a problem been mentioned and another question I saw earlier, um, not who sent it, um, but it's to do with the support that the person, um, the son was going to get uh, under the care plan under section 17, child in need provisions. Um, mm -hmm. um, her son has an enabler and due to social distancing the enabling can't physically take place in accordance with the child plan which was to help to keep the son to become comfortable in leaving the house instead the enabler is offering either phone calls or video calls which both of which are inaccessible to him because of his presentation phone calls and video calls also won't help him meet the outcome in the child plan so obviously that that's um that um, Helen's already just, just mentioned. Uh, further question, I'm not sure how practically um, possible it is to get an answer to this one. Can the enablers still submit their invoices when they aren't offering a service? They charge £40 an hour, so potentially earning vast sums of money each week for doing absolutely nothing. 
Um, I have no idea how of the contract terms the local authority dealt with it, with all of it, saying the company is to, is to be used to, the company is to be, they, they nominated the company to be used to, to pay the invoices. Can anything be done to protect these hours, enabling the son who's going to need four hours a week um, eventually the actual enabling time is only two hours um, as they charge for travel as well. So it seems to me that in the present um, state of the crisis that the country's in, I can't see any scope for someone trying to um, either get the money um, um, put on hold or preserved for a later date or to, to where someone has to make contributions themselves to get a, a refund for that. I don't know what anyone else thinks about that sort of question. It must be a common problem, actually. Um, I think in the first instance, I'd probably defer to Helen, who I think has quite a lot of experience in advising parents about how social care money is spent. Though I also think Helen might have frozen. You can't tell she looks like a statue at the moment, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now she disappeared. There she is. <laughs> Helen is with us. So I did, not, I, did you hear what I was saying, Helen? Oh. Hello, sorry, no, the Wi Fi just really keeps being very unstable, so it just sort of threw me out very quickly. I'm back now. Uh, well, I don't know, did you hear uh, the question? Uh, is, this is about um, whether or not the enabler can submit invoices um, to, if, even if they're not actually doing any enabling work. And I guess the answer to that question is whether um, it depends what the contract says, really. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very difficult to sort of answer it really without seeing what the contract actually says. I mean, it wouldn't seem very fair, but there, I know that there are all sorts of various contractual arrangements which would um, reflect that. I mean, it I mean, people often um, want to complain about the fact that the, that the, in calculating the cost of somebody, they're, they're either not being paid to travel somewhere or they're charging mm -hmm. to travel when they shouldn't be. Um, there's, there's not really legal questions. Um, Maybe it's but, a question more yeah, about yeah. what the authority can sort of give back to the person who's, who's being paid, I suppose. I don't know, it's difficult without sort of seeing the contracts or contractual terms and what the local authority's position is on it. Yeah. But it's difficult, yeah. Um, oh, there's um, another question that's come in here. A question from Pippa on Facebook. Does this new status mean that the local authority can get away with not providing full-time education? and full-time curriculum for those who've been out of school due to illness for the last two academic years. Uh, any answers to that one? Yeah, I, mean, I think that that's probably slightly different to the, the immediate issues with regard to the changes to the, the education, health and care legislation and to the, the, uh, the care provision, social care legislation as well. Um, obviously, it's a problem that's been going on, it sounds like, for, for considerably longer than the, the current crisis in any event. So, uh, insofar as there was a problem or the local authority weren't delivering provision even before that, uh, that's unaffected. And, and education for those who are out of school for medical reasons, um, depending whether they have an EHC plan as well, may fall instead under uh, Section 19 of the Education Act 1996. Uh, which isn't immediately affected by any of the uh, the new legislation that's come into effect today anyway. Um, but maybe it's certainly something that is uh, potentially affected by the, the Coronavirus Act. But again, it sounds like the issue is one which has been going on longer than that. And so may not be uh, directly impacted by any changes that are made today and may need certainly to be looked into as a, a wider question as to whether the local authority has been and is in breach of, of section 19. Okay, um, 
there's something that, that what troubles me a lot about about this um, this whole situation is that the, the legislation which we are seeing is being um, watered down or modified because of the crisis was designed to protect and assist the most vulnerable people one could imagine in society being children for most of them obviously in education cases children disabled people those who um, are least able to cope with um, a change to the support arrangements they've been used to and um, need the most help at a time of crisis so i was interested that to see that a couple of weeks ago we heard there was a challenge in the courts um, on behalf of uh, an autistic person I, I don't know if it was a, a, chi a child a, a school-aged child or maybe an older young person who was clearly suffering because uh, of the lockdown um, restrictions which meant that he couldn't go out more than once a day and I have I didn't see it properly reported, but I have an impression that the that 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 um, restriction affecting him was relaxed. And I don't think there was a court case about it. It was threatened. Does, does anybody remember this? But I, I mean, that, that's a, if that's true, that then it shows that in an individual case, it might be more possible than I at first feared to um, obtain some relaxation to the um, restriction. Of course, we're talking here today about a relaxation of, of statutory obligations on the part of the local authority. But the way that the these um, changes that were brought in today are going to impact on the most vulnerable people seems to me in theory in any way um leaving it open to an individual who's very badly affected by it um to to see whether as chris was indicating a decision to um permit um an ease the easement the um reducing the, the, the duty on the local authority might have such an impact on one person that um, it, it would be possible to find a legal uh, method of challenging. Uh, I mean, some, one of the questions, another question that came in, what happens when the family is in, uh, under stress, in stress? Well, of course, many, many families must be in that position at the moment so we, we don't yet know all the consequences of that um, but we suspect that there's going to be many more instances of um, domestic abuse and violence which is already um, coming to light um, The other thing I've, I've heard, I've read about, is a, a case in the court of protection where there's an indication of how the courts would deal with um, the consequences of the coronavirus legislation. The impression I've got is that it's going to be very hard to um, persuade uh, judges that um, they shouldn't give a great deal of leeway to um, local authorities or any other authorities who are, are doing less than their previous roles required them to do because of, of the crisis. I think I don't think this is um, a legal question. I think it's a question of the uh, of what judges or human beings like the rest of us would consider to be a reasonable position to take in in what is supposed to be a short-term 
situation. Absolutely, John. And what's interesting is in the um, in the coronavirus act dealing with the uh, adult social social care, and also that act does impose restrictions in the children act insofar as it relates to the children transitioning to adult services. So the other um, sort of relaxations of duties, both to assess and to, to, to provide plans, although not in terms of providing support so much. Um, but also there's a, a, a tricky uh, paragraph in the schedule to the Act, which um, is going to make it very difficult for anybody to, to sort of sue a local authority for always clinical commissioning group if it's a health matter, um, for any failures afterwards. Um, and I think that the, the court has to take into account, is what the Act says, um, anything that um, the, the impact of the Coronavirus Act on a local authority's failure to perform its duties, and also um, the number of people needing support. And I read that as meaning that if after this is all over, the local authority is suddenly flooded with uh, people needing help and support and assessments, that if the local authority can't keep to a reasonable time frame um, or comply with its statutory duties, a, a judge is able to actually um, consider that. Uh, and, and, and the local authority can argue that that's why they didn't comply with the duty. And it might be difficult to, to get any sort of um, um, any, any sort of of results in terms of your case there I think afterwards that's quite an interesting I, I, I don't know how that, if that will be tested in the future I'm not sure I'm sure there will be cases um, but it'll be interesting to see how that pans out so it, it gets a little bit broader than that as well it's quite interesting um, and, and quite difficult mm. yeah I mean I think you're right John that all practitioners and all parties are just going to have to take on board the fact that there are going to be unpredictable staff shortages there's going to be difficulties to some extent in delivering provision so for example some therapists a lot of therapists are delivering um, provision in the education context um, over zoom that may be possible for some therapists but not others and it may be possible for some children but not others so the 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 the, 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 the whole um the whole situation that everybody finds themselves in is going to be very nuanced and there is inevitably going to be a kind of starting point of receptiveness at least from a court's point of view to the idea that local authorities are going to be under a lot more pressure than they were previously and that um, it may genuinely not be possible to do some things that previously might have been possible so the court's going to start I think with an openness to that position whereas previously the court's position would have been certainly in respect of provision under section 42 the court's provision would probably have been well you're supposed to have done this so my starting point is I want to know why you haven't done it so there's going to be a slight change of position in that sense but the lo but but still local authorities are going to have to do something and i think tactically people are going to have to be quite sensitive about when they put in their pre-action protocol letters so uh, whereas previously you might get to the end of the statutory period and then just immediately start um start start the pre-action protocol process perhaps in this case we might be saying to ourselves in a given case maybe we wait a little while perhaps get some feedback from the school about whether they know what the difficulty is or something along those lines and then perhaps put in a letter saying can you explain why this hasn't happened yet so we're going to have to modify our approach a little bit on a case-by-case -case basis but ultimately there, there is still a duty here to do something towards um obtaining provision yeah that's, um, that's a good point mm. but i think as lawyers we don't really want to be seen to be picking everybody up as soon as the first day goes by after some time, especially at, at, at the present time, it, I don't think it would be a very attractive way of starting a legal dispute to do that. Mm, absolutely. I've realised I've got another couple of questions here. This one, this one actually is a, is a perennial problem, but I, I don't know what the effect of, other than what we've said about relaxation of duties. This is a question from Michelle. My son is transferring over to adult services. Should they still be doing transferring? And if so, how? Well, well, that's very difficult, John, isn't it? Because it's in the in the, the Coronavirus Act, the, uh, there is a, a relaxation of the duty to assess. Um, and that applies to people who are transitioning from, from um, child to adult services as well. Um, there's no duty to assess at the moment until this is over it doesn't mean they can't meet need with that but how that will work in terms of not actually carrying out a formal assessment i don't know but this of course is, is 
the easement guidance uh, that was um, produced, the sort of statutory guidance accompanying the, the Coronavirus Act in terms of what it means for social care provision, does say things such as, well, this, and the easement should only be applied here uh, if, if for good reasons such as there's a demonstrable um, lack of staff, for example. So um, it doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's not possible at all, and particularly if an assessment can be done uh, on, on Zoom, for example, um, that there can be ways of working around that people are adapting. So it, it may be worth having a conversation with the local authority about it and seeing what, what they can do. And, and as long as they have enough staff, then I can't see why you can't uh, do something, um, even if you, you have to maintain social distancing while doing that. What, what I've noticed uh, over the years is that um, it always seems to happen that once someone gets to the age of about 18, then they often lose a whole year of um, having anyone doing anything to help them in social services because they're being transferred from um, children's services to adult services. And I, what I find really difficult to understand is um, by the time they get to 18, if they're lucky they've had assessments before and everyone knows what their problems and difficulties are and what sort of support they might need, why is it there has to be another assessment by the adult services team which may not even start for a year or so after the person had reached 18 so there's a, always an interruption it seems to me in the actual services a lack of um, communication too i suppose between children and adult services is a big problem and i think that is what you've just said john really isn't that that's one of the reasons yeah um, but there's other bits of um adjustments that are being made because of the coronavirus um changes I think these are in education. I think uh, talking about uh, whether one can refer back to reports uh, on a certain age in the past and, and uh, whether it has to, you have to quote a reference to the report. But in some cases, or in many cases perhaps, the reports that might have been prepared um, for someone who is um, 16 or 17 might still be valid when they're 19. And I don't understand why, I don't think it would justify doing nothing, but um, the easiest way to make authorities do something is to refer to what they've themselves agreed they've got to do in an assessment and plan. So it is harder, but I don't see why the service should disappear for people um, once they become an adult. Um, that, that was one. And The, uh, this question from Rosemary on Facebook. My local authority are reviewing all care packages and intend to freeze payments not being used. Why aren't um, PAs allowed to work? Surely they're classed as an essential service. Um, uh, freeze payments. That, so that would be. I don't. I don't. I don't think I understand that one because um, if they're referring to direct payments, wouldn't that, what they're saying is it's not going to be passed to the service user if they've decided to freeze it because um, hmm, what, what would be the, the reason for freezing it? Um, maybe that's what local authorities do anyway, but there are more often aren't there cases where direct payments have gone on after the time when for some reason or other they couldn't be spent and the service user if that's the right word um, has collected accumulated these this, this money um, so there hasn't been a freezing situation there Surely PAs are an essential service. Uh, that, so this um, person asking the question is suggesting they're not essential. Surely that's not necessarily the case. No, I'd, I'd be a bit surprised. It's it's a little bit difficult, as is often the case. Um, it's sometimes difficult to be specific about these questions, isn't it? Because we, we, we don't know very much about the background. But I'd be a little bit I mean, I mean, some PAs will be able to work and some won't, I would have thought. Um, 
I know that some PAs um, carry out work that can be done online, for example. So if there is a local authority out there that has a blanket policy at the moment that no PAs can be can work at all, I'd be surprised by that and I'd want to know what the rationale for it is. Yeah, that doesn't sound that it would be lawful if it were so. It is, it is probably more complicated, uh, mm. different people with different circumstances. Mm. Um, there's another one here from Sonia. Um, our local authority in South Wales says they can't support children online as they have no policies and procedures regarding this. That seems totally irrational, excuse. doesn't it, really? That's irrational. <laughs> yeah. that, that seems ridiculous that um, if they don't have a policy to support children online, they have yeah, to be that's deaf. quite good that they admit they haven't got the policy. I think that's quite yeah. helpful to <laughs> us, really. really? Um, what should we as parents expect? It has been six, I don't see any, six weeks and no guidance. Well, Totally um, neglectful, isn't it? Really? Children online. Yeah, uh, again, that, that that's sorry, sorry, John. Referring to the contact which might have taken place in person from a social worker or therapist, speech and language, or somebody. Can't really tell, but um, mm. anyway, I think the answer to that one is that they have to have a policy, even if it's a policy. To justify doing very little. Mm. So. That must be right, was, mustn't it? We, we know that many, many schools, maintained schools and independent schools, are routinely providing less uh, contact, contact, pastoral contact, and lesson content online. Uh, we know that therapists are delivering provision online. Um, I would say that there should be a policy in place it's difficult for me to know what the rationale would be for not having a policy when there are so many professionals who carry out sensitive and personal work with children who are delivering support online yeah absolutely well um I, there are no more questions on my screen at the moment um let's see if i got another note about other things that I uh, thought might come up. Uh, yeah. Of course, uh, the comments have been made by more than one person who's um, on Facebook that um, as if they're saying they don't really know what all the fuss is all about because usually we don't get the support anyway. So um, that's just tragic, isn't it, really? Yeah. Um, it is. It's an indictment of local authority behaviour, certainly. I mean, after all this is over, if you're not getting support, always get advice about it because the chances are that local authority is breaching its duty, mm. or even during the crisis. But don't just sort of sit there and let it happen. Um, and legal aid is usually available um, for challenges like that, especially when it comes to children, because even if parents aren't eligible for legal aid, a child often will be, for example. They always pick up the phone to a lawyer if you feel that you're not getting the right support. There's quite no, we actually we covered we covered them. Um, oh, that's another question. Sorry. There's suddenly some more questions have appeared. Um, this is from Helen. Helen. Yes, another Helen. Mm -hmm. uh, my son's mainstream school is in the process of submitting a request for an EHCP assessment for him. He's currently in year 10 and in virtual school temporarily. Obviously, time is ticking, given he's meant to be sitting his GCSEs next year. Um, how is COVID 19 likely to delay even getting an assessment and then our chances of actually getting an EHCP? uh next year she says hmm. well it looks like it's certainly going to well it's likely to lengthen the process isn't it yeah. i think part of the problem 
So, so there's a weird sort of difference between getting assessments on video from, I, I mean, as I understand it, between getting an assessment of needs from a speech and language therapist or an educational psychologist or a specialist dyslexia teacher or whoever you're consulting and getting therapy online. And as I understand it, getting therapy online is normally, it appears to not be a problem for a lot of experts. I have to be quite careful because I don't want to just blanket say it's fine for everybody because I'm not an expert and I don't know. But at least some therapy can be given online with no, with, with very little difficulty, um, depending on the child's needs. Assessments, I think, can be slightly different because the assessments are standardised assessments that are applied across large populations and certain things have to be uniform for them to have any kind of evidential value, if you like. So, for example, I'm aware that some specialist dyslexia teachers have assessments that can't be carried out online because they have to certify as part of the assessment that it took place face to face and in private. And obviously you can't certify that if you're talking to somebody over Zoom. And then there are other assessments where I suppose attention difficulties, if the child or young person has attention difficulties, you, you, you can't physically keep them in front of the screen the way that you might be able to if you're in the room with them. You're limited in terms of giving them movement breaks or distractions or rewards. Um, so the first answer is that getting an assessment for him might be tricky, but it probably depends on what the assessment is and who's giving it and what the child's needs are. And then secondly, we know that the we've been talking earlier, obviously, about the fact that the um, EHC needs assessment timelines and associated timescales are, are being relaxed at the moment because of the notice that came out yesterday. So the answer is that the process is going to be longer. But as we have as we have said and really emphasised, it's not going to be open ended. They cannot just take as long as they like to do it. Um, I just mentioned some of the question I've, I was asked um, yesterday, um, and um, I think the answer is, um, as I have said, uh, the, the, this is that um, somebody's, the parents obtained an independent social worker's um, assessment and report for use at uh, um, education at a first year tribunal, the education tribunal. The local authority want uh, the uh, social worker to do an assessment, one of their social workers, and the parent was asking whether this, um, whether, you know, whether she should meet the social worker to, to do this. And the answer is, I would say yes, because the, the authority must be entitled to get their own um, report if they want to. Um, it's also important for the parent to be seen to be cooperating with uh, whatever efforts the, the local authority are making to to do an assessment and of course it is a matter of opinion in the end that they're entitled to have their own opinion just as the parent is. But I don't know, I mean in, in practice I think um, I would always encourage uh, cooperation and dialogue with uh, the authority and uh, anybody they send along to um, to do a report on um, the child. I don't know what what you will say about that. Are there any ever circumstances when that shouldn't be agreed? Um, no, I think you're absolutely right, John. I think it's it's important it's important to I think cooperate um, and to accept that the tribunal will consider that both sides should have had um, an opportunity to. Uh, uh, assess or observe or whatever whatever's looked for I mean with a with a social worker it probably is going to be uh, an assessment I mean if it was something like you I'm, I'm just sort of thinking about situations I've had in the past so you might have a situation where you've got a child who really struggles to um, to cope with assessments or perhaps has very challenging behavior that makes them difficult to assess and in those circumstances if you're a parent and your child has already gone through say a speech and language therapy assessment with um, a, a, an independent speech and language therapist, you possibly could say to the school, well, look, he's already been assessed. He can't sit through the other assessments again. And, and quite possibly a number of the assessments that have already been done can't be carried out again anyway. Yes. But why don't we share, why don't we share our experts' raw data and scores with you? 
and then you can do an observation because an observation is an easier thing to do without lots of pressure on the child. So there are lots of different, I think there are lots of different compromises that potentially can be reached, but fundamentally the tribunal can and, and will order a parent to make a child available for assessment, which doesn't mean that they can physically force your child to undergo the assessment, but it might mean that they will, in, an, in a really extreme, extreme case, if you don't cooperate, they might ultimately strike out the appeal because you didn't cooperate. Um, I, I've, there's another one here, which is a, a real, um, plea for help from somebody. Um, the social worker contacted us and said they're concerned as we have a package. So why are we struggling? They're saying it's our fault. My family is getting close to crisis breakdown and social care have not helped. He meets the criteria to attend school as a social worker. Section 17, Child in Need Plan, EHCP, and uh, Dad Key Worker, Mum Carer, full time. They know we are struggling, but they won't allow him to attend as I am shielding for 12 weeks on the extremely vulnerable list. Now, we've said I can move out of the home so he can attend, but they're still refusing. Um, we would ideally keep him home as safer. But we're in a position with little options, have no alternate support, care or help in place and the social work has done nothing. He has a DP package, DP, um, uh, but only have home care PAs working uh, ATM, which the social worker is aware of. Our PAs all choosing not to work can't hire agency temporarily, not taking PPI on, I'm sorry this is quite a long question, <laughs> and can't hire the PA directly without the local authority social worker, um, which they aren't doing, as no face-to-face -face checks now won't accept DBS from other um, organisations. No, no overnight respite, I'm just seeing what the question is. Nothing's been done to help signpost us by social services and now social worker called to blame us. Um, well, maybe that's not, and sadly, that's probably not an uncommon situation, is it? Um, I just think that person ought to make um, contact with the solicitor. That might well be something that can be done there. Not the sort of thing one could really answer now. Again, there's a lot of detail we couldn't possibly know. Um, there's more questions coming in now. One from Sarah. I'm in the process of getting an EHCP. I have a working document. The social care support plan is from May 2019. Yet social worker did a new assessment just before COVID. Is it reasonable to expect them to write up the new support plan so it could go in the the HCP. Oh, that seems to be the thing I was discussing a few minutes ago. We'll move on to another one. Um, question from Evelyn. What duty is left to support the most vulnerable? Is the new act completely blanket? Oh, in terms of the Care Act, sorry. Uh, go on, John, sorry, I'm picking my screen. Well, it I'm just reading what's... Um, is the new act completely blanket or are there cases where there is abuse or neglect that are still protected either by the local authority or in society? Um, well, absolutely. The, well, the, 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 I mean, the act is very limited in some respects, I think. Um, the act um, isn't, it's not blanket. Um, and it only really applies to adult social care, not children's social care and it removes the need for the, du the duty for local authorities to carry out assessments. I think that's the purpose, fundamentally. The local authorities have got a duty to provide support. The same role as having space contact. Um, it can um, do away with financial assessments. I hope that our answers have been useful to everybody. Thanks to um, Charlotte and Chris and Helen 
for helping me um, deal with these questions and, and the answers you've given. Um, there'll be uh, more of these um, webinars in due course. Um, Mike Charles is going to be uh, introducing uh, another one in a few days and um, you'll find out more about what, what we're going to cover. So uh, this is what I have to do on the Today programme now. I say we've run out of time and um, um, thank you again for joining us. Goodbye. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.